the Great Pyramid at Giza has remained a complete mystery in modern times when was it built who built it above all else? What is it conventional Egyptology declares that all pyramids were tombs? For the pharaohs the sophistication required technology and cost of their great pyramid conflict with the thought that it is simply a tomb this level of effort for a burial place stretches common sense to the breaking point. To quote Alan Alfred it is so crazy to suggest that the unique design of their Great Pyramid was a legacy from an earlier more advanced culture in my view. It is certainly much less crazy than continuing to believe that the pyramid was constructed as a tomb for a dead king and that he built this totally over engineered and revolutionary wonder of the world with absolute perfection at the first attempt it is proposed that the Great Pyramid was a nuclear fission production mill and it was a technical and financial success it did not create energy but packaged energy with an artificially created isotopes of plutonium this hypothesis is not fantastic in the sense that it would be a physical impossibility but is fantastic only in the fact that it upsets the conventional history of man. The approach is to drop preconceptions about religion and culture and look upon the Great Pyramid as a business investment. Wait till you hear this there. History of the ancient Egyptian civilization was recorded in hieroglyphs cut into stone. Even when paint was used on the stone, the symbolization was first cut into there stone. None of these stone records attribute the Great Pyramid to a pharaoh or anyone else there is no record of when it was built. Why was it built or what its purpose was? There are no symbols cut into the stone of the Great Pyramid the accuracy and the precision of the Great Pyramid th at the level of individual blocks and as a whole are without precedent modern day. Engineers are at a loss as to how it was done the tools described as necessary for the cutting of stone and their positioning of stone have never been found nor are they referred to in ancient records the precise cutting of granite including precise interior surfaces requires complex powered machinery with industrial diamond bits. The raising and exact positioning of granite blocks as heavy as 80 tons to heights as much as 300 feet above grade would require huge powerful cranes. According to current industrial practice, it is simply beyond the capacity of wooden structures and human laborers. The entire positioning of the whole structure is so accurate that modern surveying optical equipment would seem to be an absolute necessity the interior fit of stones in the king's chamber and great gallery appears to be almost watertight a mortar was used which had a higher hardness than the stone it was used on the mortar was analyzed for elemental content but it has not been duplicated the construction has a hard industrial signature rather than an artistic one the Great Pyramid was built to last as a process plant for a very long time. The heart of the pyramid is the king's chamber and the heart of it is there. Sarcophagus this was also the heart of the process the uranium oxide would have been fitted into the sarcophagus it may have been put in as bricks or pellets or even in granular form depending on their oxide use the sarcophagus was fabricated from a very hard, even harder and denser than the rest of the granite used to build the king's chamber this fact is a very significant signature of its function the interior dimensions of the sarcophagus are very precise this is consistent with maintaining a very exact amount of geometry of the uranium oxide there. Outside of the sarcophagus was rough cut 
This reflects the fact that the outside surface of the granite is quite unimportant to the fissioning process. The granite must be able to withstand the high temperatures and radiation emitted by the fissioning uranium oxide. It has to survive the damage from radiation for a long time. It must allow passage of most of the neutrons which it does photographs show that this granite sarcophagus has undergone radiation and heat damage in a very gradual manner. Over a very long time its appearance is very reminiscent of metals and minerals which experience long-term radiation in the canyons of the plutonium mills at Hanford the damage or wear indicates an operating time of many years the king's chamber is made of very large blocks of granite the inner surface of the granite bears a striking resemblance to interior walls of a plutonium mill once again there is the appearance of long-term exposure to radiation and heat the floor and walls of the chamber appear to be very well sealed this is consistent with the king's chamber being flooded with water the water in the chamber has multiple roles it is the medium which slows down neutrons and reflects them back into the uranium oxide pilot is also the mechanism for removing heat from the chamber the south air shaft from the outside to the chamber would have been a pipe for continuously adding water to the system after a short horizontal run from the king's chamber it rises at a 45 degree angle to there outside of there pyramid hydraulic calculations for water indicate that the flow would vary from 5,900 to 8,400 gallons per minute, depending on the back pressure of their water and steam in the king's chamber. The water would have flowed out through the entrance to the king's chamber down into the great gallery. The exiting water would have carried away radioactive soluble isotopes, a second air shaft connecting the chamber and great gallery to the outside would have been a vent which released a steam and non condensable gases the final roll of water is very interesting and quite ingenious the reflection of neutrons by the water back into the uranium pile must have a careful narrow control to it the mean free path of a neutron in water is about one foot a neutron must undergo about six to seven collisions in there. Water to finally reach the appropriate speed and be reflected back towards the nuclear bed. If not enough neutrons are reflected, the fission reaction will die down. If too many neutrons are reflected back, the reaction will begin to grow rapidly, producing too much energy. However, when the energy production goes, up the water heats up and begins to form steam and the steam occupies about a t thousand times as much volume as water and it would progressively occupy more of the volume of the king's chamber as more energy was released the design is a passive and very stable system for controlling the rate of visioning in there sarcophagus when operating the king's chamber would have always had some volume of steam in the upper portion. This volume would have grown and shrunk in response to the fissioning rate, keeping it in control the complex structure above the Kames chamber is a sort of shock absorber the monstrous blocks of granite with air pockets between them absorb most of the effect of the explosive steam at the end of a batch run of uranium oxide. In fact the granite beams could crack all the way through and still remain in place the much smaller and much weaker blocks of limestone could not be used for the ceiling of the king's chamber. The queen's chamber is probably the laboratory which chemically extracts sand, purifies the various plutonium oxides. From all other waste it is noteworthy that this chamber is placed quite a 
distance from the lower end of the grate. Gallery this distance would give added protection to workers in the chamber. The two shafts which leave the Queen's chamber are of unknown purpose, but they were definitely pipes which conveyed material waste separated from plutonium. Would have been walked back to the well, shaft and dumped down it. The wearing of gold face masks, etc., would have been excellent protection from the radiation. In the Queen's chamber, the production of fissions such as cesium 137 and strontium 90 are quite soluble, whereas uranium and Plutonium oxides are extremely insoluble. A constant pass through of water in their king's chamber would have flushed these short lived radioactive isotopes all their way to the underground chamber by their great gallery trench and the service corridor. The service corridor is small and winding, and mostly vertical human travel through it would be very difficult and pointless since there. Ascending and descending corridors are available. It shows extreme erosion. Why would a pharaoh's tomb pyramid have extreme erosion in a shaft isolated from the outside world? Even floods would not have reached this court. Or the obvious answer is water erosion over a very long time. Part way down the shaft is there. Grew to the position just barely below. The surface of the prepared bedrock base. For the pyramid, the underground chamber has an interesting geometry. The eastern half is about six feet below there. Termination of the descending corridor. In the center of the eastern basin is the bottomless pit, so called because there earlier discoverers could not find a bottom there. Western area is about eight feet higher and it has five bench-like protrusions, and two depressions a walkway is cut, from the eastern basin up into the western chamber halfway between the two, large benches to the south is a, horizontal chamber that is 30 inches, wide by 30 inches tall by 53 feet long, this last excavation could not have been, dubbed with hand tools the material is, bedrock and there is not enough room to swing a tool such as a pick especially with the worker lying on his stomach or his back powered machinery seems to be the only reasonable answer the purpose of the underground chamber was twofold the first purpose was to drill a hole down through the bedrock to a sand layer below the depth might have been one hundred to several hundred feet the Radioactive water coming from the king's chamber would finally go down the hole and disperse into the sand layer. This is a routine methodology in secondary recovery oil fields where they inject hot water or steam or gas into a sand layer. The sand layer would have accepted and retarded the migration of radioactive isotopes long enough for them to decay to trace levels. The second purpose was hydraulic power the entire floor of the underground chamber bears an amazing resemblance to the support structure for a water driven turbine electric generator the water wheel would have extended out from the western chamber into the eastern chamber there water coming down the descending corridor would have shot across there water wheel the benches on the western chamber floor would have supported their rest of the machinery including their generator there is even a support and depression for an oil cooling system there stairway cut into the western floor gave access under and behind the water wheel to where the shaft and couplings would reside based on the projected water flow from the king's chamber there head of the water dropping almost 300 feet and a turbine efficiency of 78 percent the produced electrical power would have been from about 29 kilowatts to 41 kilowatts this is an adequate amount of power to provide lighting within the pyramid and to run modest 
electrical machinery in the Queen's chamber the chemical separation of plutonium from uranium involves the use of electrical power just as it was done at Hanford Washington this generation and use of electricity would have been entirely within the Great Pyramid hidden from outsiders the floors and well hole a strongly eroded the obvious eroding agent is water and the entrance to there descending corridor is well above there landscape so natural flooding could not be the cause the grotto which is just off the service corridor would have been a logical position for an electrical distribution point and for changes in voltage so if this is the case what were they generating all this power for it is entirely obvious that this pyramid is of an unknown age but it is certainly older than at least 10,000 years wouldn't you guys agree comments below thanks for watching it almost looks like the blade had a curvature to it so there's one way to find out if it Walter to adjust and that is to put a straight edge on it we go we glide together let me walk pen hall is idle a weather flight was it yeah so this is chris testing for flatness of a possible ancient the surface comes out here and then it kicks in you've got to write in arabic actually yeah you got two different cuts it comes down here naturally this free then the right steps out one that they were just kind of slicing off those just to make them fit just to you know have the top that's an ancient soccer you can tell is here you look at that you can see how their surface could have been pounded by stone to get the surface but here that's clearly evidence of some kind of tool like a saw cutting through the material for the top half this is at the great pyramid and similar to peru what we see is different materials different forms of workmanship from crew to incredibly refined here again going to look at another saw cut example but this is i'm just blown away this is their great pyramid of jiza here have a look at this this is an obvious socket see this is the this is the rough layer and then this is not only flattish but that you can see where the cutter like the saw or whatever stopped because here is where it's broken away and on this side too but what blows me away has been just the number the amount of evidence here's nuts so this is the great pyramid at jiza and they're the original what's left of the original casing stone you can see right there and this is just our first half an hour here and this blows me the completely blows me away because we've seen obvious evidence of machine cutting technology in basalt which would require as far as i'm concerned tungsten carbide or diamond tools and that's obviously why we're we're here with christopher dunn and stephen mailer because this is their expert on technology he works in a very modern establishment and has done for 50 years in terms of working with the most modern high-tech equipment for cutting materials and shaping materials and with Stephen Mailer we have the oral tradition based on the work of old Dohakin Ayan so with the two of them we have all the ability to look at their left brain and the right brain amazing stuff I had no idea you mainstream historians will tell you that the great pyramid of Giza was a glorified tomb for the Egyptian pharaohs the only monument left of the original seven wonders of the world this structure was created with impeccable mathematical precision and is a unique mysterious feat of construction and of engineering there's only one problem the Great Pyramid has none of their characteristics of tunes including extravagant artifacts ornate wall art sealed entrances elaborate coffins or 
even mummies themselves it was however built with unique materials the same materials that are used today for electrical conductivity these facts are leading more and more historians to believe the pyramids may have had a far more useful purpose the pyramid of Giza was not at all the tomb but a power plant generating and transmitting electricity to the civilization surrounding it impossible it's important to comprehend their tremendous effort that went into creating these monuments the pyramids of Giza are among no less than 118 of the say structures in Egypt alone and that doesn't even include those pyramids in other parts of the world given our current understanding of how early civilizations built their monuments it would have taken no less than 20 years to build these so-called tombs and that's if no less than 20,000 workers worked daily to this day historians still can't prove exactly how or when they were built this leads us to ask what resting place for the dead could possibly be so important that it would warrant such phenomenal effort time and precise engineering even without knowing that they have nothing in common with regular tombs you only need to stand before them to realize that's a lot of work for a cadaver naturally we make conclusions based on the assumption that ancient civilizations were more primitive than us but what if intellectual evolution isn't always linear can advanced technology be lost and rediscovered centuries later is it possible that an ancient culture had knowledge of and used electrical power to know for sure let's look at another case where technology of power generation appears to have been used and then forgotten we know Edison and Tesla brought electricity into common use moving into the 20th century yet in Iraq in 1934 three artifacts were found together a ceramic pot a tube of copper and a rod of iron which when combined with the liquid acid can be used to create chemical reactions that produce an electrical charge known as the Baghdad or Parthian battery these materials date back 2000 years 10 years after their discovery someone using grape juice with similar materials successfully generated a few volts of electricity this process has since been demonstrated on the discovery channels program mythbusters where lemon juice activated the electrochemical reaction between the copper and the iron producing 4 volts of electricity nowadays you can simply search online to find instructions on how to create your own battery using these chemical principles but historians have long assumed that thousands of years ago there was no knowledge of this technology that this archaeological find is mere coincidence even though we've long marveled over artifacts with intricate gold plating which requires electricity to be created quite simply energy generation happens as a result of simple chemical properties and can be done by anyone with four basic materials so here are some important facts about the structure and the materials of their pyramid for starters it contains angled tunnels which lead not only into their pyramid but deep underground to areas claimed is still to be unexplored what two needs a shaft directed into their earth we also know that centuries ago there were enormous swivel doors that weighed no less than 20 tons but miraculously it was so well engineered it could be moved to enter with a push of a hand since no Egyptian tomb has ever been found to be deliberately accessible what was their interest in continuing to visit the mummies or could such a door have served the purpose of perhaps containing and insulating their 
space inside though you'd almost never know it the Great Pyramids of Giza were once covered in white polished limestone. Referred to as casing stones the cuts made in this reflective stone were angled perfectly so it would have a smooth flat appearance. This would have made the giant structures brightly reflect the light of the sun like a mirror it also would have made perfect insulation inside their structure a large earthquake in 1303 disrupted the casing stones and they were removed to use on other structures. Today all that remains is the inner core of the pyramid the image of their incredible amount of light that would have reflected from the monument raises. Curiosity as does the reason for their insulation was there a desire to draw attention to their dead to keep mummy s warm or cool or perhaps something else. Next the material dolomite was used on the inner surfaces dolomite is known to increase electrical conductivity directly relative to the amount of pressure on it. High pressure creates more electrical current next lining the passageways and underground tunnels of the pyramids is granite which is slightly radioactive. Granite contains higher amounts of quartz crystal with metal and it's a well-known conductor of piezoelectricity piezo. Electricity occurs as a result of stress or pressure on the quartz as demonstrated by the wristwatches which can be charged simply by rapidly shaking them. This granite actually ionizes their air inside the pyramid creating a chemical reaction which again increases the conductivity of electricity when such electrons are given the chance to bypass sections of rock via metal wire. Quite large currents can flow another important material used to construct them is the mysterious mortar half a million tons of it which holds the giant stones in place, though it's been analyzed many times modern technology has yet to exactly recreate this gypsum which comes from sediment this gypsum can withstand tremendous pressure and astounding the is even stronger than the stones themselves clearly it's contributed to keeping the monument intact for thousands of years but could there be another reason why they used a material which could withstand such a high pressure so limestone dolomite granite supposedly constructed for a tomb are in fact analogous to the exact materials we use to make electrical wires they also share a relationship with pressure which increases their electroconductivity just northwest of the great pyramid is the Serapian here there are 20 huge granite boxes each weighing 100 tons classic Egyptologists say these are coffins yet the granite here came from 500 miles away and each box is so large and so heavy that there's no possible way can fit through the existing tunnels and entrances these supposed sarcophagi were therefore somehow built into the structure with such precision there within a ten thousandth of an inch of being perfectly flat. In the meantime many electrical engineer will explain that a container serving as an energy capacitor raw battery must be made entirely of the same substance so there's no interruption in the magnetic field could these boxes be just that if so there's a centuries old granite sarcophagus on display in an Egyptian museum that's thought to be unfinished unlike those in the pyramids this one's cracked suggesting that perhaps it wasn't unfinished but simply abandoned because the crack which occurred would have interrupted the magnetic field permitting it from successfully serving its purpose so there is clear evidence to support the possibility of an electrical use since the supposed sarcophagi are clearly way too large for 
a human being the accepted theory is that they were yes believe this bull coffins for the pharaoh's prized bulls makes you wonder who came up with the bull coffin theory to add to the mystery in 1993 a mysterious and inaccessible room was discovered after remaining hidden for thousands of years appearing to have deliberately been concealed by the structures engineers the room came to be called the queen's chamber and was finally explored in 2011 with a small remote camera to reveal a long lost mummy hardly it contained carefully crafted copper wire and more importantly there were instructions painted as symbols onto the floor which appeared to show a clear wiring diagram look at any battery from those used in large power plants to the smallest pellet batteries in wrist watches and you'll see that they require a metal such as copper to create the chemical reaction known as potential difference you can run an electric current through copper wire and the coil will produce a short-range magnetic field at a second coil and the power is transferred from one coil to there are there a window less room with copper wiring could create a higher potential on one wall which transfers energy to the lower potential on there are the wall consequentially releasing electromagnetic energy into the confined space of the so-called queen's chamber dot sadly these wires have since disappeared entirely and mainstream egyptologists claim there's no functionality whatsoever to this room as they also claim there's no functionality of anything in this structure beyond their ways it serves as a tomb good place to note however that the foremost Egyptologist Zai Hawass was indicted for theft of Egyptian antiquities it could still be argued that their electrical materials used to construct the Great Pyramid are simply coincidental because an energy generator still requires a catalyst from another source perhaps then this explains why the pyramids are geographically located over a powerful natural generator underground rivers and aquifers physio electricity could be harnessed from there power of the current as the water flows and it has been proven that thousands of years ago the Nile River passed directly by where the structures now stand of course this brings in a debate about the age of the pyramids themselves along with the weathering on the nearby sphinx indicating that the monuments are actually double the age there currently assumed to be perhaps that would explain why there's no mention of the pyramids or their creation in any of the egyptian writings so if water was a source of power it would have traveled up the limestone based on the principle of capillary action which happens when a small area of a substance that gets wet absorbs into the entire area of that substance so water flowing near or underneath air pyramid could have been absorbed as it passed over the limestone even traveling upward to the top of the structure the quartz and the tunnels of the pyramids would subject to the stress or vibration creating zooelectricity the high force speed of the rising water and there pressure would be analogous to filling a syringe generating electromagnetic energy within the structure by their materials within it and conducting it upwards to the now missing capstone but why the geographical location of their pyramid may give us some clues it is located exactly at a point which magnifies the electromagnetic forces on the planet where Taliaraka currents are at their strongest as an electromagnetic field at the bottom of the pyramid which would rise to their upper layers with these chemical reactions we don't know for sure what kept the pyramid but there is speculation that it may have been gold explaining of course why it's long since 
been missing if it were gold this could have created a conductive path for energy to be directed upwards high into the ionosphere. If superconductive materials were used to create this monument for energy then the potential for something even more amazing might have been possible. Wireless electricity sound far-fetched. One bold and extraordinary man swore this was possible and he may have showed us how we know of Nikola Tesla as their solitary genius responsible for their electric engine radio laser radar and for creating a tremendous competitive spirit in Thomas Edison we know Tesla sought above all to serve mankind in fact despite his extraordinary contributions he's scarcely known or credited for his genius at the 1893 World's Fair Tesla transmitted electricity naturally to a light bulb he held in his hands and he created the Tesla coil which is used more today for show than for the function it was intended to serve most importantly we know that Tesla claimed adamantly that he had perfected the method of harnessing and transmitting free wireless energy using their electromagnetic nature of the planet in a patent Tesla file in September of 1897. He claimed that at 30,000 feet altitude, there's a stratum of rarefied air that would conduct electric currents at high voltages in this proposed system was a transmitter which would transmit millions of volts into the atmosphere. Then he had something received the electricity and reduce the voltage to a convenient potential to be used by consumers in an experiment the last week of July in 1903 nearby residents claimed to have witnessed Tesla successfully conduct his experiment at the Warden safe tower while Tesla himself sharing his new method of conductivity said that it lit up the night sky as if it were a giant fluorescent tube it's even been said that he successfully wirelessly transmitted pictures and sounds though all of his work has been mercilessly destroyed this cannot be proven sadly Tesla's technology was confiscated shortly after his death he died in poverty and the US government destroyed his tower claiming it was being used by German spies had Tesla succeeded in his mission there. Distribution of power on this planet would have been very different today. Compare Tesla's technology to their pyramids the location height and electromagnetic materials we've seen. Induction between copper wires work for short distances for a long distance. Transfer the same principle can be applied when acoustic energy is converted to kinetic energy and their frequencies match the way an opera singer can shatter a glass when their sound wave he is singing matches their resonant frequency of the glass so if there's a magnetically oscillating current and you create a second possessing same frequency the wireless transmission can pass through solid materials and through long distances there frequency which would have been released from the pyramid would have to have been matched in the surrounding area perhaps. This would explain the obelisks the tall monuments which could be acting as receivers particularly if there's a quartz stone at the top of them this would also explain the ancient carvings in Egypt which so clearly indicate light sources. It's boggling to think anyone would even argue it in the Hatha temple there. Dendra light is one such image it perfectly resembles modern electrical technology showing a wire inside of a bulb-like area and a box which appears to be a receiver across from this. Carving is a similar image but their system appears to be falling into their hands of a reptilian looking being as though it's a warning of the potential to abuse as technology. 
mainstream historians scoff and make more primitive conclusions but still there. Pyramids show no sign of sit from flame. Torches instead there are multiple carvings which show these antennae like objects that appear to be a transmitter near another object shaped like their famous symbol the NKH which appears to be the receiver given all this it seems so much more believable that the great pyramid functioned using the same principles and conditions as Tesla sought to demonstrate that they conducted and directed electromagnetic energy into the ionosphere where it generated and transmitted electricity wirelessly to receivers within their civilization we've long believed that the pyramids were just tombs but this theory raises more questions than it answers why do they have nothing in common with other tombs why the unique construction materials made to build it including the very materials required for conducting power why the oversized granite boxes proven to have never contain any mummies or the ones that are clearly too large for humans why the alignment with the North Pole that 20 ton swivel doors intricate tunnels and chambers shafts and areas still yet to be discovered why is there no soot from fire torches anywhere inside the structure and why do the tunnels protrude deep into the earth these mysteries still elude our understanding but more and more people are accepting the possibility that their great pyramid of Giza had a more important function than we understand we know there is a heightened electromagnetic measurement around their pyramid that's equivalent to that made in an electrical storm we also know that if you look at them from space you can see that they're actually eight-sided not four-sided and that there are strange heat spots observable only with special equipment they have unique electric materials including copper and a design that suggests high pressure and water power they have a powerful magnetic structure and placement over the telephic currents they're aligned with the stars and their unique art of the area shows clear depictions of wired light sources all these are things suggest there's a lot more to this story than we've been told all these circumstances make the likelihood high the pyramid was created to be a compact energy generator and a broadcasting system that transmitted electricity wirelessly the implications for this understanding of electrical power by an ancient culture is huge it would rewrite history as we know it do you think that free energy could be transmitted wirelessly around the world and whether or not you do believe that do you think that if it really could do that we would actually know about it thank you for watching and hit the like button if you enjoyed this video if you're new please hit subscribe and there bell next to it to be notified of future releases